I'm Barbara Hebert, President of the Theosophical Society in America. The Theosophical Society and the teachings of Theosophy are based on the concept that all beings emanate from one source, whatever we choose to call that source. We are souls who are residing in bodies. The experiences we have in our lives are important. They provide us with lessons, with opportunities to learn and to grow. Racism, genderism, ageism, classism, and almost any other ism you can imagine have no place in this organization, in the teachings of theosophy, or in the lives of theosophists. H.P. Blavatsky wrote the majority of her works in the mid-1880s, and as such, she wrote in the language of her times. She also talked about her perspective on the evolution of humanity. That perspective varies greatly from the current theories of science. Therefore, through the years, misunderstandings have arisen. Pablo's presentation clarifies some of these misunderstandings, but it may also raise questions for you. This is a good thing. Questions are always helpful. Questions are essential for our personal and spiritual growth. And through questioning and looking at ourselves and looking at society, we may all come to realize that every living being deserves respect, honor, and dignity, because every living being is sacred, and every living being is interconnected with every other. We are going to see today a subject that is controversial, that's why we left it for the end of the conference, so I cannot ruin it. <laughs> and notice that you already have the evaluation form, so that you <laughs> evaluate this before. But uh, I think this is a great subject, and it's actually a perfect example of the difficulty that theosophy poses in trying to help us understand who we really are. Madame Blavatsky is the author of The Secret Doctrine, as we have seen, and she wrote about these root races in The Secret Doctrine, but she was not the first one to write about this. We see um, these teachings in Sinet's, uh, Alfred Sinet's book, Esoteric Buddhism, which he collected from a correspondence he had with Blavatsky's teachers. So the first thing we need to know is that in the theosophical tradition, there is the idea of secret teachings. And this was something that people didn't like when Blavatsky would say that there are teachings that are secret. And they don't like it today, too. There is this concept that uh, if there is uh, information out there, why can't I have it? Why aren't you giving this information openly? And Blavatsky had to defend this idea uh, frequently because when the secret teachings are given out, they can backfire. And this is exactly what happens. I think the, the, the teaching about the root races is a perfect example of what Blavatsky said. So, for example, she said, man, and remember in the 19th century this is meant to to mean everybody, is ever craving for a beyond and cannot live without an ideal of some kind as a beacon and a consolation. So she's talking about we need spiritual teacher, teachings that are our beacon, the, the marking the direction we are going to, and also that gives us consolation, uh, hope, uh, encouragement to go through life. At the same time, no average man 
even in our age of universal education, could be entrusted with truths too metaphysical, too subtle for his mind to comprehend, without the danger of an imminent reaction setting in. And this is an occult principle the reaction setting in. When Blavatsky wrote Isis Unveiled, he, her first book, there were some teachings she claimed she was not allowed to, to publish until they could see what was the response to the book, to Isis Unveiled. The uh, idea of reincarnation was one of them, and many others. And you see that in history, even on an exoteric plane, whenever there is a revolution, it is always followed by a counter-revolution, by a pushback that is trying to counteract what the revolution was proposing. And when we come to the occult realm, when certain teachings are given as a gift, as not something that humanity toiled and came to, like it happens with science or with regular philosophy, uh, these teachings are, were given through Blavatsky in the theosophical tradition by a group of enlightened beings that are trying to help human evolution. But because of the karmic law, when this gift is given to humanity, there is a price to pay for that. There is also the door is open for a karmic setting back that is going to balance the, you know, the scales. And this is something that happened with many of the teachings of the Theosophical Society, and I think mainly with this idea of the root races, because the Theosophical Society was founded primarily, prominently. You see this everywhere. This is the first object of the Theosophical Society as phrased in 1886, when Blavatsky was fully engaged in the writing of the Secret Doctrine, to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, or color. There is a, a, there is a explicit, evident statement that the aim, the main aim of the Theosophical Society is a brotherhood of humanity that doesn't make any distinction of race. And then Blavatsky, in the Secret Doctrine, as Maria showed us, she dedicated the work to all true theosophists in every country and of every race. If Blavatsky had any racist intention in mind, as she is often accused to when, when dealing with the root races, why would she dedicate the work in which she explains these things about the root races to theosophists of every race? She could have stopped to all true theosophists or in every country, but she made a point to dedicate it to theosophists of every race. This is not consistent with a, an intent or with a, an idea that is racist. And also, we have, for example, I, I could show a hundred quotes about this. I'm just picking some important, prominent quotes. There is a letter from what is known in the theosophical tradition as the Maha Chohan. This is an enlightened being that is the the master or the teacher of Blavatsky's teachers. Blavatsky's teachers are highly revered in the theosophical tradition. This, this is a, an enlightened being that Blavatsky's teachers revered as, as a person that had a wisdom that even they couldn't attain. And there is a letter that was published as the first letter in this book that compiles some of these letters from the masters of the wisdom. So, this letter is considered by many as the most important letter that came from the Masters of the Wisdom that says, to achieve the proposed object, he's talking about the object of the Theosophical Society, a greater, wiser, and especially a more benevolent intermingling of the high and the low, the alpha and the omega of society, was determined upon. Part of the aim of the Theosophical Society was to bring together those in powers, those devoid of power, those who were dominant, those who were exploited. And especially this was a letter to theosophists in India, to the British, the Anglo-Indian um, citizens, and the, the Indian population, 
the white race must be the first to stretch out the hand of fellowship to the dark nations. This was, of, of course, in the 1880s, a time where the British Empire was in, in charge of India and they were being exploited. And the, the Mahachohan recognizes this prospect may not smile to all. However, he is no theosophist who object, objects to this principle. So if you are going to accuse Blavatsky or theosophy of racism, then you have to take into consideration all these prominent documents and how you can bring together, harmonize the idea of a racist intent with an explicit object of breaking down the barriers of racism. You can cherry pick obscure quotes in complex uh, um, arguments within the secret doctrine that when taken out of context seem to be racist. But then you have to, if you are doing a serious study, you have to confront with the reality of this and more than the ideas, the actions of theosophists. The Theosophical Movement has a record of working to break down separation and barriers. It, there are no instances of real Theosophical organizations where, as a result of the teachings, there are uh, attitudes of racism or things like that. So the problem is that this subject is misunderstood. And it's misunderstood for many reasons. My purpose today is to try to set, I'm not going to describe the qualities of the different root races, etc. I'm going to try to give the context, the foundation, how to read, how to study these teachings so that they can be properly understood. The main problem we have as humanity when dealing with this subject is the problem of personal identity. Who am I? I would postulate that you cannot understand theosophy if you don't understand what your real nature is. You may read about reincarnation, you may read all the details, you may be able to give lectures about that, and if you have a wrong view of who you are, you are going to give the wrong message. This happens a lot within the New Age. In the New Age, most people accept reincarnation, but it's a personal reincarnation. You give a talk on reincarnation, many people come. You give a talk on service, very few people come. Why? Because reincarnation is sought as a continuation of my personal self. And that is a basic misunderstanding. Reincarnation is not about that because we are not about that. We are not the personal self. And this is especially important when we deal with the teachings of races and sub-races, sub etc. So who are we? The classical definitions that you can find in dictionaries, we are a mixture of mindset, values, behaviors, skills, attitude, and external appearances. Or we are the qualities, beliefs, personality, looks, and expressions that make a person or a group. This is our identity. Theosophy would say that is absolutely wrong. And if it, this is what you believe, if you believe that you are this, you will never understand the theosophical teachings in general and the root races in particular. Because the theosophical teachings are a soul-centered teaching and the preliminary teachings are soul-centered. The deeper teachings are universal self-centered, let's say. But Let's not go so far. In the, hum in the theosophical tradition, we could separate, we could classify the human constitution uh, on three main levels. Of course, we can divide this in four, in seven, there are many ways. But for our purposes, we say that the highest aspect of ourselves is a universal principle. We call it the monad. It's a divine spark. It is one with everything. And this is the universal self, the Atman, that has been mentioned in previous lectures. Then we have what we could call a soul, which is an enduring principle within us. It is individual. I have my soul, you have your soul. Uh, now, 
my soul, your soul, are different expressions of what we really are, that is the one self, the oneness, the unity. But at this level, there are different expressions of that unity, which we call my soul, your soul. So it is individual, but not individual in the sense of the personality, as, as we are going to see. It is a transcendental individuality. We don't have really a word that, that is good to describe this. And finally, we have the person. The per while the soul is enduring, the personal is temporary. While the soul is transcendental, the person is a psychobiological construct. It's not something that is, it's, it's just a collection of everything that we saw as personal identity. A certain look, certain ideas, certain feelings that are put together when a soul incarnates in a body. Now, the soul is beyond all the characteristics of the person. The soul is beyond gender, is beyond the ideas that the personality absorbs from the culture, is beyond all of this. So when looked from the soul's per perspective, from the point of view of the soul, gender is just a temporary mask, vesture, I, as a soul, an important aspect of the theosophical teachings is to develop a deeper and deeper sense, not only knowledge, a deeper sense. And for that, you need to practice a spiritual life, to try to live the teachings. So a deeper sense that we are the soul. And this is done. I, I've seen in my life at this point, I have seen many people dying. When people outside the theosophical tradition die, they normally, I, you know, I have relatives, friends, they normally die with a sense of fear or attachment or regret and easiness because they are naturally identified with the personality. But of all the, per the people that I know closely within the theosophical tradition that died, they died with a joyful sense with a sense of acceptance, even of looking forward, with the denial of just trying to extend the physical life by all means, even if that the quality of life is very poor. And this is a result of a deep conviction that we are not the personality. If we don't have that deep conviction that may begin intellectually, but it has to penetrate more than the intellectual level. If we don't have this deep conviction, again, we cannot understand the theosophical teachings. So when we think about gender, we feel that the gender is just an accident. I'm not proud of being male. I'm not ashamed of being male. When criticisms are, are pointed towards the, the males, I don't feel like they are criticizing me, I, I can recognize, of course, we all have you know, some um, shadow aspects and some light aspects, everything has. And because I'm not identified with my particular gender, I can recognize, yes, in these cases, this is something that we do wrong. In these uh, other cases, this is something that is right. And because I'm not identified, I want justice, not for my gender, not for the other gender. I'm seeking justice, so it doesn't matter if that justice implies to criticize my gender or, or, or the opposite. So the same with ethnicity. I'm not, you know, I don't feel that I'm proud of being Hispanic. I'm not ashamed of being Hispanic. It's just an accident. I don't care. I don't even think of myself in those terms. So when there are, you know, criticisms or praises, to any particular ethnicity, that doesn't affect me. This is just an accident. I, as a soul, have been, in the theosophical view, incarnated in many ethnicities in the past and will be incarnated in many ethnicities in the future. This is, again, just a temporary accident. I'm interested in justice. So if any ethnicity is being abused, I'm interested in trying to help to prevent that abuse. But not because I'm Hispanic, I'm particularly interested in what happens to Hispanic you know, ethnicities. And same with the nationality. I'm Argentinian, or my body was born there. And again, except in sports, I'm not identified with Argentina. 
And I would say, except in the sports that we are good at. <laughs> so it's, it's, again, it's an accident whether I'm Argentinian or not. Now, this is a perspective that every theosophist that really begins to generate a certain insight into our true nature naturally has. Every theosophist, whether he or she un under realizes it consciously or not. And the proof, the ultimate proof, is in how you face death. Because that is no more ideas. This is the fact. Your personal life is ending. And that's when what you are inside comes to the forefront. And I'm really impressed, and I hope that I will have the same maturity. I'm impressed seeing how my friend's theosophy is passed with that nobility, with that joy, with that sense of looking forward. So the idea of the root races is in the context of an evolutionary theory that unless you understand this, again, I'm going to say that many times because it is essential. Unless you understand the evolutionary theory, you cannot understand the subject of root races. And within the Theosophical Society, we may know about the, the evolutionary theory, and yet, as I'm going to suggest, we still keep looking at this many times from the point of view of creation. The idea that we were raised, uh, um, that we grew up into, the idea of creation, especially in the Judeo-Christian tradition, is imprinted in our unconscious mind. And even though we may believe in the evolution uh, of the body, the soul, the spirit, many of our puzzlements about the theosophical teachings come because unconsciously we are still looking at things from the point of view of creation. So what do I mean by that? In the theosophical view, souls are gradually developed developed, not suddenly created. I would say that, in my view, a theosophical statement would be, not all souls are created equal. That's a shocking statement. Now, let us think what it means, what the, the opposite statement, that all souls are created equal, what that means. What, is, what are the implications? You know, something that the Theosophical Society always promotes is inquiry, question, think. I know that's not very popular today, but this is something that we need to do. So if all souls are created equal, how do you explain the difference between a person like Mother Teresa of Calcutta and a serial killer? Both souls are, crea souls are created equals. So the serial killer evidently has degenerated, has perverted his soul. Because he could have been like Mother Theresa. What's the other, the other explanation? In the Theoso that is, that is uh, something that, of course, and he, because he perverted his soul, he can be doomed to eternal suffering in hell. That's the logical conclusion. Now, when I say not all souls are created equal, the reason is because souls were not created. They were not created like pristine souls fully formed from the very beginning to be incarnated for the first and last time in this particular body so that everybody starts from the same place. In the theosophical view, because souls are gradually developed, we have souls of all ages. We have souls that are baby souls and we have souls that are very mature souls. And the baby souls, will act in ways that the mature soul will never do. And this is very important when understanding all of this, and we will see why. So there are these souls of different ages, as I said. And this is from the very beginning of humanity. Blavatsky explains that because there is this process of evolution, and because souls didn't start not even in the evolution on Earth, they didn't start you know, when human evolution started on Earth, they all start from zero. So this is a race. So if you are more evolved, it's because you are a better soul. Because we all started from the start line, and those who are further ahead, it's because they are better. Those who are behind, 
is because they are worse. That is not the idea at all. From the very beginning, because this is a chain of evolutions from planet to planet, from the very beginning there were uh, differences in the ages of the soul. So in the secret doctrine, Blavatsky says that some souls had already reached in previous cycles of evolution in previous planets, during previous cycles of incarnation, that degree of intellect which enabled them to become independent and self-conscious entities on this plane of matter. The souls incarnated in the, in the early humanity and they were already intelligent beings. They didn't start from, from proto-human states in the transition between animals and humans. And they actually became the guides of the early humanity, of all the baby souls. Because some of them were like this, but others, Blavatsky says, are simply those latest arrivals among the human monads, those souls that came last, those new souls that were introduced into the human kingdom, which were not quite ready as were the others, which have to evolve during the present evolutionary round. So we have souls that were very mature and souls that were newly developed souls. Newly developed from where? Well, just as we derive our physical evolution from animals, we also de derive our, the evolution of the soul from the animal kingdom. So there are transitional states. There are states, stages in the soul where the soul is not yet fully human, but it's not what we could call an animal soul. Again, evolution has this quality. So there are some transitional states in which Blavatsky calls these stages semi-animal, and that sounds really awful to us. Perhaps today, you know, we, we love to pay attention to words. Uh, words become uh, debased, and we change the, wor the words, and then we fool ourselves into thinking that we change our attitude. If you search in, on the internet, you know, politically correct terms, it's really amazing. You cannot say this, you say it in such convoluted ways. And, and we feel exactly the same, whether we use one term or the other. But we fool ourselves in, into thinking that just because we, we use one word or the other, our feelings are different. And we judge people for how they use words. So today, instead of saying semi-animals, we probably would say proto-humans. This is also in an anthropology. The early races, uh, the cavemen and all of these, are considered to be these proto-humans or, or these transitional stages. Now, that happens even with the souls also. There is nothing uh, incompatible in this teaching of thinking of the souls in that way, just as we think of the bodies. So, as I said, in the theosophical view, the idea is that everything has a divine spark of monad, from the atoms to human beings and celestial beings. Now, that divine spark be begins to develop a more and more complex soul. So all sentient beings have what we could call a vital soul. In animals, it develops to more complexity than in plants, and we could call it an animal soul. And eventually, a human being is that uh, form of life that has developed what we can call an intellectual soul, or in theosophy is called the ego, or the ego, the sense of I-ness. So human beings have a soul that has developed this permanent sense of I-ness, which incarnates in one body after the other. Animals are in the process of developing this. Higher animals are very close to developing this. And the, the early human beings at the beginning of evolution, many of them were very close also to the beginning of this. Uh, while there were other human beings that had fully developed this in previous incarnations. So the idea is that when we look in terms of evolution and not creation, we see that there are souls of different ages. We see that there are transitional states, souls that are in the process of coming from a human experience to the human experience, experience, 
this is, these transitional states are more common at the beginning of evolution, of human evolution on Earth, because there, are, there is you know, more of the new, newly developed souls that with the time, as time passes, they begin to develop. So as we get later and later in evolution, there are less transitional states. And then there are older phases that gradually disappear. In the same way that a child needs a different environment than an adult, and when the child grows, leaves behind the, child, the childish environment and the toys and the activities, there are also phases of life, cultures in the, in the far past that were, were important and necessary when there, there were all these baby souls. But as the souls grow up, then these cultures disappear. Now remember, we are not the cultures. The cultures are just like classrooms. And we go to certain classrooms, and once, if you have a school where, you know, in the theosophical view, there is a, a regular influx of new souls only up to a certain point, to the middle of the evolutionary cycle. No new souls appear then. And then you have a group of souls that repeatedly incarnate through time, and then the older faces, less and less souls need the older faces, and then they gradually disappear. This is part of an important teaching that is the law of cycles. Everything is impermanent. Forms are impermanent. Because we are attached to forms, then when we say that certain uh, cultures or, or um, you know, ethnicities, that they disappear because they were not useful any longer. It seems like you are judging the individual that is there. And what we are saying is the opposite. The individuals that were using that have evolved, and then that particular use, or, or, or culture, or custom, or religion, is not useful any longer. And those individuals that were evolving there were ourselves, not other individuals. We evolved through all of this. We used certain ways that may not be useful any longer. We stopped incarnating in those particular or going to those particular classrooms. Uh, and the, the, the current cultures that we are so proud of will also disappear, will also degenerate and disappear, just like many empires. And when I say degenerate, it doesn't mean falling into evil. It simply means, you know, what happened with the Roman Empire. It's not that people in the Roman Empire uh, collectively became evil and degenerated and disappeared. No, things move on. There is a law of cycles where cultures, races, nations develop, rise, and fall. And this is a universal law. For example, one of Blavatsky's teachers said every race and sub-race, we will see a little of that later, the distinction, follows the law, the law of development, growth, maturity, and decline. This is a universal law. It will happen to Europe. It will happen to the US. It has happened to others. It will happen to the future civilizations. And this does not mean, as I said, that the people in that culture, they all degenerate. The causes for the fall of empires are very complex. Empires, nations. Uh, many times, what this, the way a culture begins to decline is not because the people who incarnate in that culture are worse the, or the souls are less evolved. The typical way in which a culture declines is because the wrong kind of people begin to be in power. You know, for example, there, there is today a lot of um, backlash against, the, against Islam. It's, it is a violent religion. See in the Quran, it says this or that. Well, look at the Christian scriptures. It tells you that if a person is gay, you should stone that person to death. You know, Leviticus. If you disrespect your father, your young mother, then you should be stoned to death. So it's very easy that if that kind of, of look, outlook gets into power, then it's not a problem of Christianity. It's a problem of who are in power and what what aspects of any tradition, culture, religion are enacted and how they are enacted. You could think also of the Theosophical Society. 
all these teachings about road races could very easily degenerate and turn into a racist view. And if the people who are in, in power, in charge, leading the Theosophical Society begin to have that misinterpretation, the Theosophical Society will degenerate and, and can become a racist organization. This happens to everything. But that doesn't mean that Theosophies would be all evil. That means just that the wrong people are leading the organization. And the same with countries. If you, Blavatsky went to the Middle East, she met with Sufis, she learned from Sufis, we can learn from Sufis. There are very wise people in the Middle East, but they are not the ones that are in power. And this happens to every culture, and this will happen to us, this will happen to Europe, this is a universal law. So this is what I said, even cultures in their downward cycle, because the, there is this idea of the, the rise and the fall of cultures, still have highly developed individuals. So for example, in one of the Mahatma letters, uh, one of Blavatsky's teachers say, less than two centuries prior to the arrival of Cortes, the Spanish people to, to America, to South America in this, or Central America in this case, uh, there was a great rush towards progress among the sub-races of Peru and Mexico, as there is now in Europe and the USA. This was in the 1880s. There is a rush, part of the cycle is, there is a rush you know, towards progress, but then there is also a decline. And then uh, we know that there is a, it is a mystery how the Mayan empire disappeared. We don't know, all of a sudden, it disappeared. So the master says here, before we knew anything about that, their sub-race ended in nearly total annihilation through causes generated by itself, and so will yours, the European race, he was talking to European people, at the end of its cycle. So this is the fate of all. Now, again, if you are identified with one particular culture, this feels threatening, this feels scary, but cultures are garments. You use a shirt until that shirt begins to wear off. And then you change the shirt. You are not, well, some people are attached to, to shirts. <laughs> but if you are more or less mature, you are not attached to the shirt. You just dispose of it. So cultures, nations, again, if you were born in the US, you are not American. You are a soul that eventually, in this particular lifetime, was born here. You can say anything you want about Americans. It's not about yourself. Because in your previous uh, uh, birth, you may have been in any other country, and you will be in any other country in the future. This is not who you are. And cultures, they have their specific qualities. You know, I, I lived in four different countries. I traveled around the world. I know there are differences. They are superficial. At, in the, you know, at the core level, we are all the same. We all have the same kind of fears, desires, wishes, etc. But externally, there are differences. Growing up in the US, and again, each country is different too, so let me generalize. Generalizations are always difficult. But growing up in the US will give the soul a different experience than growing up in Argentina. Neither better nor worse. In some aspects, it will be better. In some aspects, it, it won't. It is important in, in the theosophical tradition, diversity, as we are going to see, is very important. With all the talk about unity, unity is not uniformity. The reason why there are different nations, races, uh, different qualities, different genders, is because the soul needs a variety of experiences. My experience as a male that has not had children is very different from my experience as a mother. So I, I, as a soul, you as a soul, need to go through all the different experiences. It's silly to attach yourself to your present experience simply because it is the present experience. You are not a mother any more than you are you know, any, anything else. So this is what we need to always keep in mind as we, see, uh, as we study this. There are cultures, nations, uh, eth ethnic groups with different characteristics, with different cycles, going up, going down. None of that is you. These are just stages in a play. These are just classrooms. You come today here, 
you gather experience, you go tomorrow there, there is no uh, progression that if you are born in the US, that means that you are more evolved than those born in another, another uh, country. There is no sequence, no progression. You need to have all the experiences. So with this, let us see what is this racial theory that Blavatsky proposes. And the first thing that you see is that it's quite complicated. And you know, we were in this uh, conference, very interesting conference in Harvard a couple of months ago. And one of the scholars, when try we, we were talking a little about this, and we were trying to explain the complexity of this theory. And one of the scholars said, but why would Blavatsky develop such a convoluted idea and such a you know, nuanced uh, theory? Now, that is the wrong question because we are, we are approaching theosophy in the wrong, wrong way. This is like asking a quantum physicist, why would you develop such a complex and weird theory? He would say, it is not me, I'm trying to describe nature. And nature seems to be very complex. So same with this. In general, what scholars don't necessarily understand or, or don't accept if they do, is that theosophy is not a philosophy. A philosophy is a person that a philosopher today is a person that sits down and tries to think out a theory of life that can explain what we observe. And when thinking about this, you have 20 options, 20 different ways of explaining the, the, the reason for suffering. And most philosophers try to find the shortest, the clearest, the you know, answer, uh, the cleanest answer. Uh, so if you think that theosophy comes in that way, you would say, why would Blavatsky create this very convoluted idea? But if you think of, of theosophy as a science, as the occult science that I was talking about yesterday, well, it is complex because nature is complex. Take any area of science, see you know, the, evol ev the evolutionary theory of the physical bodies in science and see how complex it is. And you don't expect by reading just one book of two volumes in science to understand now you are a, an evolutionary biologist. But then people expect that they can read one or two books on theosophy and they understand the evolutionary theory which not only involves the physical aspect, but also involves the spiritual, the, the soul aspect. It's far more complex than the scientific view. But it's not that Blavatsky made it up. This is how nature is, or, or so is her claim. So you may say, well, I don't believe Blavatsky. That's fair. But if you are going to judge Blavatsky, you have to judge her from the perspective that she's coming, not from your perspective. Then again, you can say, OK, this is, this is what she is really intending, and I don't believe her. Fair, that's fine. But don't, don't uh, project your own worldviews onto her teachings and then interpret her teachings from that point of view. This is a typical uh, mistake that is done since the beginnings of scholarship. You, know, you go to a culture, you observe from the outside, you interpret what you observe with your own prejudices, and of course you are not going to understand what that culture is. So in the theosophical view, there is the idea of seven root races. The idea of root means this is, this is a stage, an evolutionary cycle, a movement from which a lot of races come. The root race is not a race in particular. It is a stage, an evolutionary stage, that is the root of all the races that come from that particular stage. And there are seven. We know very little about the first two root races, which were non-physical. This was before the Earth was solid and we, in, in the way that we know, them today, we know it today. Uh, we know something about the third root race. Uh, humanity became physical about the halfway of the third root race. Then there was a fourth root race, and we are supposed to be in the fifth root race. So here there is a sequence. The fifth root race is more evolved than the fourth. The fourth is more evolved than the third. This is an evolutionary sequence. And I saw, for example, 
a, a website where a person says uh, it was something like a blunt acknowledgement from theosophists that the fifth root race is more evolved than the fourth root race. This person didn't believe that there was a fourth root race and didn't understand what the fourth root race is. But these are things that span millions of years. In Blavatsky's view, the fifth root race started one million years ago. To give you some context, the Stone Age, according to our history, started, ended around 5,000 years ago. Everything we know about history and prehistory falls at the end of these million years of, uh, that the fifth root race has been developing. At the beginning, a million years ago, just as a seed, and more as a race on its own, it was, was later. But we are talking about here um, ta a time span that science doesn't even believe. Science doesn't believe that there were people one million years ago. And there is a justification in, in theosophy why we don't, we don't have remains from that old. Along with the idea of the root races is the idea of a change in continents. And most of these remains are under the ocean. So when the time comes that we can explore the oceans, we may find some of these remains. But in any case, Blavatsky says the mankind of the first root race is the mankind of the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, etc. So these are evolutionary stages of ourselves. It's not that the fifth root race is more evolved than the fourth. It, this is like saying the person, a 21-year-old you know, person, is older than himself or herself when he was 14-year-old. Well, of course. So the fourth root race is what we were you know, over a million years ago. And hopefully, we are more evolved right now. This has nothing to do with racism and with, with you know, saying that one race is higher than the other. But then you need to understand what these words mean. As Mitch Horowitz said, if you just take out of context any of these things, well, you are making a fool of yourself. You know, I understand that in, in people, not norm, you know, regular people, they, they don't necessarily want to go into detail and understand this. I don't expect them to do that. But scholars should. Scholars, you would expect them to be serious and look into all of this before they arrive at some conclusions that, for anybody that knows these teachings, are evidently wrong. Uh, many of them do. Some of them don't. You, know, you have to remember that, for scholars, this is their livelihood. They need to publish articles, papers. They, uh, and they don't have 20 years to study this, as I had, before they publish a paper. So it's natural. I, I understand all that. But we need to also understand that there is an intrinsic limitation when trying to study these things for people that cannot spend 20 years studying all this. So about the seven root races, the third root race that I talked about was called by HPV Lemurian. And this was a, a race that you know, we know very little about. Then the fourth root race is the famous or infamous uh, Atlantis that was supposed to be on a continent that is where the Atlantic Ocean is today. And the first root race, Blavatsky called the Aryan race. Aha, uh -huh, I got you. You are racist. The Aryan race. If you were not racist, at least Hitler was inspired by your theories. Well, the term Aryan was adopted by scholars in the 18th century to describe people of the Indo-European languages. It is derived from the Sanskrit Arya, which means honorable, respectable, noble. An example of this is the Arya Stanga Marga, Arya Noble, Astanga Eightfold, Marga pa Path. This is the Eightfold Noble Path of the Buddha, which in Sanskrit is Arya Stanga Marga. So this word was used in Sanskrit from, you know, you, you see it everywhere in their literature. Actually, the, the Hindu tradition called themselves Aryans because this always had the connotation of the noble ones. This was applied originally to the rishis, to the sages. And then the population ended up calling themselves the Aryans. 
and the Arians in the scholarship of the 18th century, 19th century, and even today, it includes most modern inhabitants of Australia, New Zealand, you know, Australasia, the Caucasus, Central Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, Siberia, South Asia, South Af Southern Africa, and West Asia. This is what today, after Hitler took this term from the regular scholarship of the time and perverted it, today we do what we always do, change the name. So we call the Indo-European you know, race or, or family of languages. Now it is called Indo-European. Before it was called the Aryan because all these, these uh, people came from the root, the Sanskrit, these are languages that came from the Sanskrit root and you following the root of the languages, you can see where these people spread. And these are all the countries where these people spread. And this is what was called Aryan in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century until Hitler reinterpreted this term to mean only the Nordic or Teutonic uh, you know, um, ethnicity, let's say. So Blavatsky uh, reluctantly adopted that term. She says the fifth root race is generally, though hardly correctly, called the Aryan race. But this is how everybody knew this stream of you know, migration. And Blavatsky said, sure, if this is the, the term that they use, I can use it. So Hitler didn't take the word Aryan from, from Blavatsky. This was very accessible at his time. The problem is that all scholars dropped that word, and they now does, don't use it. But because we are using Blavatsky's books, I mean, we, uh, perhaps we could uh, we are not attached to this word in particular. Perhaps we could arrange with everybody that is publishing the secret doctrine to change the word for Indo-European. Um, it is impossible to do it because people who are not related to the Theosophical movement are printing the secret doctrine. And it would be a superficial change. Yeah, it would be a good PR move, but that's not what we are in, you know, in the TS. So today, unfortunately, when people see Blavatsky using the word Aryan, and she's, her books are among the few that still use this word, I understand that they assume that either Blavatsky took it from Hitler, on, on, although Hitler was born many years after Blavatsky, but people don't know, or they can assume that Hitler took it from Blavatsky. But again, this is all a misconception. So, and Blavatsky said, the Aryan races, for instance, just following the, the scholarship of the time, she agreed on that. Now varying from dark brown, almost black, red, brown, yellow, down to the whitest creamy color, are yet all of one and the same stock, the fifth root race. So in Blavatsky's writings, the fifth root race is never um, identified with the white race, never at all. Actually, Blavatsky was quite critical, she held the dark brown aspect of the, the Aryan race as spiritually, you know, more mature than the, what she called the European aspect. She said that the Indian culture was the first sub-race within this Aryan root race. And it has a natural tendency to spirituality that the, the you know, our European and European-derived countries they don't have. They are far better, she says, uh, on an intellectual level. And there is, again, a reason why different ethnicities, they do have different tendencies. And that is very important to keep. You know, because we don't know how to relate to differences, we try to abolish them. So male and female are just the same. And of course, we, ha we need the same opportunities. But there is a richness in the female approach, there is a richness in the male approach. If we were more mature and could value, e value equally those qualities without trying to impose them, there can be males who want to do things that are more related to the female aspect because we have both aspects in ourselves. But we shouldn't try to avoid differences, to abolish them. So different ethnic groups they do have certain tendencies, and this is in general, not the individuals. You know, 
using sports, if you go by the amount of World Cups that, um, that different countries uh, won in soccer, you would say Germany and Brazil are the best teams in the world. Argentinians would say that's not true. But <laughs> let's say, you know, that's a fair statement. So you say you have this general statement, Brazilians are good at sports, Ger uh, at soccer. Germany, you know, is good at soccer. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody there is good at that. That doesn't mean that people in other countries cannot be good at that. Actually, the two best players today are one Argentinian and one Portuguese. They are not from the best countries in the world. And this is the same with the ethnicities. There are general characteristics in ethnic groups, in cultures, in nations, in, in religions, that as a generality you recognize, you see. But then that doesn't limit the individuals. Within that, there are individuals of all kinds. And it's not that because this ethnicity is more spiritual, then all individuals are spiritual. It's more of a, a question of traditionally, this ethnic group values spirituality. Traditionally, this ethnic group or nation or culture values intellectuality. And therefore, they have that kind of flavor. But again, you are neither one nor the other. These are classrooms. It is important that we, you have all the classrooms. If in a high school, the math teacher says, math is the basis of everything, it's the highest, let us turn every subject into math. That would be silly. Why would you do that? So same with the different cultures. And now this last statement that this uh, group of migrations came from the same stock, the fifth root race, this is a shorthand for really saying the same stock that originated the fifth root race. Because the idea is that what about all the other people? You know, the Chinese, for example, they were not in that list. Are they an inferior race? Are they not the fifth root race? Are they different? What about some of the Africans? Are they not fifth root race? That is not what this means at all. You need to understand how is the transition between one evolutionary stage that we call fourth root race, Atlantis, into the transition of the next evolutionary stage in which we all are, Atlanteans were very tall, many feet tall. Today, nobody's like that. Atlanteans had four senses. Today, we have all, we have five senses. Evolutionary speaking, we are all fifth root race in the sense of the fifth evolutionary stage. But then, from Atlantis, how, how the new evolutionary stage develops. When the previous continent or the previous root race is about to end, there are cataclysm, catastrophes around the, the world because there is a change in continents, because there is a, um, a, a, like a final karmic account of what that evolutionary race uh, did, and they need a clean slate or relatively clean slate for the next evolutionary cycle. So a way in which the negative karmic causes produced in the past are you know, erased is also by means of these catastrophes around the world. So the continent in which all the fourth root race was begins to crumble. In some places it sinks, in some other places there may be a volcano, some, some places stay as an island. So in the transition you, ha you have pockets of humanity in different places. In one of the places where the conditions were right, this particular a group of human beings begin to migrate. And all the human beings that derive from this particular group is what is called the Indo-European, this is what happened with the fifth root race, the Indo-European family of languages and people. So that's what is referred as to the Aryan races. Now there are other pockets in the world that they keep on evolving, but because of the conditions of the time, they didn't spread in the world in, in other ways. Now, they are still fifth root race, but their cultures, their bodies, their genetic lineage doesn't come from this particular group that spread. Now, this group is not better than the other. This is just anthropology. Unfortunately, Blavatsky talked about the root races with numbers, and we assume 
you know, that numbers means, you know, higher or this or that. Uh, unfortunately, our hearts are spoiled. And when we see any talk about differences, any talks about different colors in particular, we immediately react. But this is just an anthropology. And again, you may have been born today here. Tomorrow or the next lifetime, you will be born in China or in India, in Africa, whatever. There is no real, as I said, sequence. We need all these different um, uh, experiences. So when she talks about the Aryan um, ethnic group uh, uh, coming from the stock, she's, she's saying the stock that originated the, this, in this fifth root race, but all the other pockets of humanity are still fifth root race. And Blavatsky says, if tomorrow the continent of Europe were to disappear, and other lands to re-emerge instead. It is the descendants of those, because some people in the 19th century, the English and, you know, I suppose Europeans in general, really thought that uh, Africans in particular, she's referring to them, but other races also, were intrinsically less able to be intelligent. We know that in this country happened the same. There, there was the idea that some bodies are intrinsically less than other bodies. And Blavatsky says it is all contextual. It, it has nothing to do with the possibilities. It has to do with the environment. So she, she said, if the same will happen to Europe, that is going to happen, she says later, and it is the descendants of those of our highly cultured nations who might have survived on some one island without any means of crossing the new seas, that would fall back into a state of relative sagery. Thus, the reason given for dividing humanity into superior and inferior races falls to the ground and becomes a fallacy. So she says, isolate, and this is biological, isolate any community, any group of animals. And there is a biological rule where that, because there is no ge enough genetic you know, variation, because there is not enough uh, variety of experiences for the soul, those groups that are isolated begin to fall back. In, instead of developing more and more culture, they begin to be more and more simple, more and more in tune with the physical environments. Now, again, there are some souls that may still need to have a simple experience. What is wrong with that? With that? Of course, if you identify with with eth ethnicities, with bodies, you will feel personally affected. I, I understand that fully. That's why I say, unless you have the feeling that you are the soul, it, I understand how things like this may feel, even if you have the, the idea that you are not the bodies, this may feel like it's attacking your personal identity. Because no matter what idea you have, you feel that you are the personality, or this country, or this culture. Now, all this that Blavatsky talks about, she talks about cultures in the past. She's not saying that you know, the, this country is less evolved than the other. We are all on the same boat. You know, there is something that scholars don't understand. In the world, there are some tribal um, groups that are disappearing. In some cases, they are disappearing because we exploit them, by we, you know, the developed countries, or we bring illnesses. In many other cases, they are just disappearing. Their fertility rates are falling. Just like it happened with the Mayan culture, they disappeared before the Spanish went into there. There was no outside influence. There is this idea that at some point, certain classrooms are not needed any longer. And the souls that were incarnating there, and now they are older, they incarnate in some other places where there are different um, you know, experiences that they can take. So there are few cases in which you could say there are some uh, little groups that, yes, they are classrooms that may be you know, for younger souls. You know, uh, in the past, when things were in order, there were different cultures with different ways of life that were appropriate for a certain stage of the development of the soul, you don't rule a, a child as you do an adult. With a child, you are more forgiven about certain things. You understand that the child needs this. It needs more protection. And, but then you don't let an adult behave like a, like a child, because the adult has other responsibilities. 
So in the far past, there were, it seems, different cultures that accommodated souls of different growth. And that was great because nobody was out of place. But then when the more uh, powerful groups of people begin to exploit the less powerful, instead of helping them, as we do with children, we help children. But what we do in humanity is to bully, to exploit. And that begins to mess up the karma. So the person that exploits that soul is born in that environment. The person exploited is born in the environment that exploited that, that uh, culture, for example. And then everything begins to fall out of order. So then you have people who are living with certain set of rules, and that is unfair for them as souls to ask them to live by those sets of rule, rules because they are younger souls. We should be helping them to live in the best possible way with the morality that they can aspire to. Annie Besant wrote a beautiful little book on Dharma where she says morality is relative. It's relative to what the soul needs to develop. So right now, we have people that are, are, or souls that are forced to live in a certain environment and that they can't. And then what we do when they can't, we punish them. Instead of, of course, a person that is killing around, not too different from what happened in California maybe 200 years ago, that they would go in the far west. I don't know, I just, I'm talking from the movies. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> But they would go in the far west, just kill another person, and it was fine. You know, this is what you do. In Argentina, in the early 19th, uh, uh, 1900s, they still had this dual uh, you know, fight. It was legal, and they would resolve things by killing each other, you know, in a respectable way. <laughs> now, this happens today, and this person is a murderer. We send them to places where we punish them instead of recognizing well, this person is just out of place. Can we provide an environment that helps the person grow? So you see, all this is entangled with this idea of the evolution of the soul that is necessary to keep in mind. And then the idea is that within each root race, we are all, the whole humanity is the fifth root race. And there are different sub-races. So there are, right now, according to the theosophical tradition, we have developed five sub-races. Now, according to Blavatsky, each of the four preceding sub-races of the fifth root race has lived approximately 210,000 years. So each of these lasts for 210,000 years. So you see, even within the sub-races, we are talking about an immense amount of time. Everything we know of humanity is within the fifth sub-race. When Blavatsky talks about previous sub-races, this is far in the past in cultures that we know nothing about. So she would say history, or what is called history, does not go further back than the fantastic origins of our fifth sub-race a few thousand years ago. And then the other thing is the, the idea of racial purism, the idea that we should, you know, we, we need to go back to the purity of a race. That is not in the theosophical tradition, that is out there in the world. Uh, the theosophical teachings are absolutely against this. The idea is that each new sub races develop from the intermixing of the different ethnic groups. The way evolution proceeds onward is by mixing different ethnic groups, by mixing qualities by mixing experiences, by developing a new pool of experience that can offer a different set or a new pool of, quali pool of qualities that can offer a, a different sets of experiences for, the, for the, the soul. For example, she said that a new sub-race in the next few hundred years will begin to develop in the west coast of uh, America and then in uh, Australia, New Zealand, because the next root race that will be in the future in a few million years, so around the corner, <laughs> will, a new continent will be, will be raised between the west coast of the US and Australia, New Zealand. So California will be the, or around that, will be the east coast of the new continent. Now Blavatsky says, 
by that time, there will be other nations, uh, you know, the US is not going to exist any longer. This, we are talking about millions of years. With Michel, we are trying to see where exactly, so we, we buy some land to have an ocean view. <laughs> you know, but, so in some incarnation, we have this ocean view. Anyway, so Blavatsky says, pure Anglo-Saxons, hardly 300 years ago, the Americans of the United States have already become a nation apart. This was in the 1800s, before the US became really a power in the world. And owing to a strong admixture of various nationalities and intermarriage, almost a race sui generis, a race on its own, not only mentally, but also physically. So you see, due to the intermixing, they are ensured the germs of the six sub race and in some few hundred years more will become most decidedly the pioneers of that race, which must succeed the present European or fifth sub race in all its new characteristics. So if you are proud of being American and being the seed of the sixth sub-race, probably you will be European when that happens. So, you know, when you are superseded. So you see, you cannot take any of this personally. So this is the end. The, so that the new sub-races develop from intermixing the different ethnic groups. Each new sub-race is a response to new needs in the evolving souls. So going back to the original stock would imply a process of devolu devolution and stagnation. And this is why in the theosophical view, there is a, an enormous respect for diversity. Let me finish. I couldn't find the quote from HPV that is so clear, but HPV said this many times. And Ibesan says, unity and uniformity are not the same. The life is one, but the splendor of the world depends upon the diversity of forms. The greater the difference, the greater the amount of the divine light that shines through all. In multiplicity, then, not in uniformity, lie the richness and the beauty of religion as of all else there is in the world. And this is the theosophical view on diversity and why we need to preserve it and not try to homogenize everything. Thank you. Pablo, this is, uh, has been exceedingly helpful to me uh, because I'm not nearly as scholarly as you are in these areas, and I thank you. I do have a question, though, and that is we have made a great effort within theosophy to address the issue of racism, etc. Why do you think we have not done the same thing for the LGBT community? Mm -hmm. I suppose that, I mean, it's just a, a contextual thing that, you know, all these were not really issues or public issues when the Theosophical Society was founded. And they are becoming to, to be more uh, public issues right now. So it is more to modern authors that, uh, that this falls on modern authors to extend this idea of, you know, embracing everybody to also this community. Uh, I often mention that Blavatsky says that the separation of, of gender is just a temporary accident. When we fall low into matter, then we have two genders. We didn't have two genders before. We were androgyne. And she says that the next evolutionary stage in the six root race will go back to an androgyne state. So in the transition, she says, there will be people who will be freaks because they will be different, but as time passes, there will be more and more of these freaks until they become the norm, and then the, the other ones are going to be the freaks. So because this has to do with you know, uh, the, the coming back to, to the androgynous state, it's very plausible that all of this that is happening is part of that process. Now, any transitional state is chaotic. It's, it's always like that. So the transitional states are neither this or that. We don't know how to deal with it. But in time, they stabilize in, the, in, a, in a different new normal. So I think there is a, 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 an argument there to deal with this. And it falls on, on us modern you know, speakers and presenters to put it forward. Pablo, first, I would like to thank you. This was incredible. 
Many of us have had DNA tests to look at the multiplicity of our backgrounds that we didn't even know were there. How does DNA place in the evolution of the reincarnated soul? Let me say what I want to say, very little. <laughs> but I think it has a little more that, you know, I think we put so, too much emphasis on DNA being coming from molecular biology, you know, DNA is simply coding for proteins. And the proteins are not the result or are not a big factor. They are a factor, but in my view, they are not a big factor in who we are, in how we are. You have, you know, uh, e uh, exact twins uh, that, that they are completely different. They have the same genome. They have the same um, environment that they were raised in, and many times they are the opposite. So I think we put too much emphasis on the DNA. It, of course, has a certain, this is, you know, in the, in the, the idea of the skandhas, in Buddhism, for example, you have the rupa skanda. The rupa skanda is the, 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 the pattern, let's say, on which your form is built. But this is only one of the five skandhas, and it's the lowest of them. Sure, it has some, some you know, influence on you, but it's just uh, not, not, not as relevant as it seems. Uh, any in any case, for people who, are not, who do not consider themselves as a soul and are still attached to the body, it's nice to see that they have DNA from, from many cultures. Uh, I fell into the workshop discussion uh, a few days ago, and I fell into a discussion about let us do not only brothers, but brothers and sisters. And let us uh, have a meeting high in the top of your organization to change that. And I would recommend everyone who is responsible for that to listen to you and your presentation and see what we are. We are reincarnating souls and personally, I feel offended when they call me sister because they look at my body, mm -hmm. yes? And I am a soul like everyone else here. And your presentation is the right answer to that discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, there is always this tension. You know, unfortunately, our, our culture in something that I think is a, a superficial move is too focused on words. At the same time, because our culture is affected by words, then certain words have a different effect than others. This normally is not so much the case within the Theosophical Society, but it is always the tension. Do we acquiesce with something that seems to many of us a superficial movement uh, and try to change our words that this is an unending you know, process, because we uh, spoil any word that we create in you, you know, after a few decades, that word becomes offensive again, because we are not changing our attitude. So should we be doing all of this, or should we um, educate people to see beyond the words, beyond the superficiality? Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm relatively new to theosophy, um, and I found um, your discussion on the root race to be very interesting. But I'm having a lot of difficulty seeing the root race as not a hierarchy, something other than a hierarchy. I mean, even aside from the numbers, just moving from left to right, mm -hmm. can you speak to that? Yeah. Root races, you could consider root races as a hierarchy because this is evolutionary stages that we all have gone through. It's not that there are some people who are forever the fourth root race, and we are the fifth root race. As Blavatsky said, we were all Atlanteans. When she talks about the history of Atlantis, this is our history, our previous incarnations. So these are like simply you, you talk about a child, you talk about a teenager, you talk about an adult. There is a hierarchy there. So the root races are evolutionary stages in which hopefully in the next evolutionary stage, we are a little more mature simply because we have gone through more experience. Now, that is not the case with the sub-races. The sub-races are not that the, the first sub-race is less evolved than the fifth. Blavatsky, as I said, said that the first sub-race, 
has a, a quality of spirituality that none of the other sub races have. And that the fifth has a quality of intellectuality that the others don't. And normally the fourth has a, a quality of the affectionate nature and beauty that others don't. And these are, they, they are different because they give you like different flavors of the human existence. So that instead of um, talking, instead of talking about a hierarchy um, or, um, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, instead of saying, um, you're not using a hierarchy, what you're not doing is saying one is good, one is bad, or one is mm -hmm. bad, better, better, best. Well, I have no, I mean, the, the, the easy answer would be yes. But I have no problem with that. You, you, you have no problem with accepting that an adult is more mature than a child. That doesn't mean the child is worse. That doesn't mean you should exploit the child. We need to learn to recognize differences from the point of view of love. So the fifth root race is a race that hopefully is an evolutionary stage, let us not call it race, evolutionary stage, where we should be better than we were a million years ago. So I have no problem, you know, speaking honestly, to say, yes, the fifth evolutionary stage should be higher, more mature, more evolved than what we were in the fourth evolutionary stage. Uh, it's our history, it's not somebody else's. Okay, so we finish here, just let me show something, uh, because the swastika is something that Blavatsky is also accused of. Coca-Cola, before the Second War, used the swastika. The US Army, uh, before uh, the Second War, used the swastika. A California fruit company was called swastika. This is from the BBC News. Uh, how the world loved sw the swastika before Hitler stole it. So this is not Blavatsky's fault either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Padre.